Hello and welcome to week one of our webinar series, Remote Sensing, a Forest Cover and Change Assessment for Carbon Monitoring. My name is Cindy Schmidt and I will be giving the introduction to this webinar, but our primary instructor today will be Professor Martin Harold from Wageningen U University in the Netherlands. So if you can all, some of you can just give me a, a yes if you can hear me okay, that'd be great, and then we'll move forward. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, lots of yeses. I also want to welcome um, all our returning RSET participants as well as anybody who is um, new to our RSET training. We're going to go over a few things um, that we go over for all our RSET trainings. Um, for this particular course, we're going to have two sessions each week. Um, on Thursdays, session A will be from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time, and session B, which is a repeat of session A, will be at 10 to 11.30 p.m. Eastern Time. You should only be signed up to attend one of these session times. We've created both of these sessions to reach our broader international audience. We're going to have lectures with many guest speakers who are subject matter experts, followed by short Q&A sessions. You can, as usual, find all the course materials at, at the website listed here. This includes session recordings, the presentation materials, and homework exercises. We will also have all of our presentation materials available in Spanish. If there are any additional questions, you can also email me or my colleague, Amber McCollum, at the email addresses listed below. We will have two homework assignments for this webinar series, which will be submitted through Google Forms. To receive credit for homework, you must submit all answers via Google Forms by the specified deadline. The deadline for week two homework, which will be your first homework, is in three weeks, Thursday, June 30th. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend four out of five live webinars and complete all the homework assignments. It takes some time to process these certificates, so you can expect to receive them about two months after the completion of the course. There is one prerequisite for this course. First, you should know and understand the fundamentals of remote sensing. Um, and one way you can do this is by watching our on-demand course listed above, which includes two one-hour recorded webinars that you can watch on your own time. As I mentioned previously, you can access all the course materials on the RSET website. Each week, you'll be able to find a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation in both English and Spanish, a link to view the recording of each week's webinar, and the PDF of each homework assignment, and a link to the Google Form for homework submission. Please note that in order to view the webinar recordings, you have to register. This helps us keep track of who is viewing them. Once you register, you'll be automatically taken to view the recording. The main objectives for this course are to provide an understanding of carbon monitoring and its global importance, show participants how to use remote sensing for forest monitoring, provide techniques for estimating carbon, provide information on how to conduct accuracy assessments, and finally, to provide information about reporting and verifying carbon estimates. This is an overview of the whole course agenda. All four weeks, all five weeks, will consist of a mix of lectures and demonstrations. This week, Martin Harold will provide an overview of carbon monitoring. So this week, we will introduce the UN Framework Convention for Climate Change Red Processes, provide guidelines for greenhouse gas inventories, and finally discuss how to plan um, and implement a national forest monitoring system. The training materials for this presentation were developed by the Global Observation of Forest Cover and Land Dynamics Group. The materials can be found on their website listed on the next slide. 
Also, this presentation can be found on the RSET Carbon Monitoring Webinar website listed be below, as we mentioned previously. Here are the specific websites where the complete set of training materials for this week can be found for reference. Using the GOFSI Gold website, just click on the Access Materials link to access the materials in English, French, and Spanish. You can also access exercises, support documents, and references. I would now like to hand the presentation over to our guest speaker, Professor Martin Harold from Wageningen University. So Martin, over to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I uh, feel privileged to talk to so many people all over the world through that network. Thanks for um, uh, 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 Cindy and her team to set that up. Um, I am uh, going to use, as said, the materials uh, that we have developed as part of the Gorsi Gold exercise. And uh, the reason is that they fit quite perfectly on what we have in mind in terms of teaching you today. Uh, the link was provided mainly because this all, I'm going to present two of the modules out of 14 modules, in fact, that are available uh, through that website in case you're interested to get um, more, even more information on some of these topics. Um, I, my background is remote sensing, so I have a, a technical background, although I have to warn the people that are expecting a very technical uh, presentation today that this is largely about the policy context and the requirements and how that requirements translate into the way we should do monitoring in the context of Red Plus. So it is uh, perhaps for some of the technical people among us relatively soft, but it's very important because monitoring happens for a reason, and we have to be clear on what we're monitoring for and why if we want to do a good job in actually doing that. And we operate in the context of the UN Climate Convention, the UNFCCC, um, and the related IPCC Good Practice Guidelines that have been approved uh, by the uh, parties, by the countries that have signed up to the process. And that is basically our framework we'll have to work in. So after the course, you should be able to understand the, the context, the climate convention context, and the requ requests, uh, the requirements for monitoring for Red Plus. Uh, I'll explain in a second what that is, in case you don't know, and the fundamental con concepts of using the IPCC Good Practice Guidelines for that purpose. Um, the following slides just show a whole bunch of background materials that are all available free and open online, uh, such as the guidance document from Govsi Gold, from the GFOI, by, from, provided by USAID, uh, the various decisions of the UN Climate Convention that contain the technical details on what we're going to talk about. I'm going to skip through them. I will refer to them in the presentation, and you, can, you feel free to come back to them uh, uh, while or after the actual lecture. So um, I'm actually going to split it in two parts. Uh, the first part is going to mainly focus on the UNFCC background and the IPCC Good Practice Guidelines. And there is a second part, perhaps with a short break in between, where we can uh, talk about national forest monitoring systems in, in a bit more detail. So the first part is uh, we will have the following outline. Um, talk about the policy back background, uh, what has been decided on the UN Climate Convention level, and what are the IPCC Good Practice Guidelines, and how can we use it for our pur purposes. Um, so let's start with point one. And, you know, very generically, uh, it's important, and I guess I, everybody is kind of aware that tropical forests, they store a significant amount of carbon, that carbon they store in the various pools, carbon pools, above ground, below ground, biomass, the life uh, biomass pool, in dead wood, litter, and in, in the soil. And these, this carbon is, is changing, uh, and is also in particular changing uh, as forest gets cleared, and that carbon is being released to the atmosphere. And because this release to the atmosphere, uh, has an important role in actually to, to attribute or to add to global climate change. Uh, this is actually a serious issue, not only uh, uh, as far as being gone, but also for the climate change agenda. 
So if you look at the recent IPCC good practice guidelines, which is now a couple of years old, but if you look at where these greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change are actually coming from, you can see there's a, the various sectors, uh, including the sectors that include fossil fuel, and that is the biggest chunk of it. But there's also a sector called Afolu, and Afolu is agriculture, forestry, and other land uses. So that not only includes the changes from forest, but also from agriculture and other land uses. It's generally referred to as the land use sector, and that has an important fraction of the total greenhouse gas emissions. And because it has an important fraction of that, it is an important target for mitigating uh, these greenhouse gas emissions in, in the climate change agenda and in policies relating to reduce em, em, emissions. If you look then on a distribution of actually above ground forest biomass, so that is only the above ground forest biomass, you see that the tropical forests contain most of the life biomass on this planet. And uh, that is because tropical forests tend to have higher carbon stocks or higher biomass values than uh, temperate and boreal forests. Uh, but we also know that in particular in the tropical domain, these forests are under particular threat. So the decline of that carbon pool uh, is quite prominent and um, is an important part of the equation. So if we look at forest biomass, we, from a climate perspective, we would like that carbon, that biomass, to stay where it is. It should stay in the terrestrial domain. It should even grow, ideally. You want to have more, ideally more trees to take up carbon from the atmosphere. And we don't want that carbon to go in the atmosphere by being released through processes like deforestation. So this is just a static view of looking at forest biomass. Uh, if you then look at dynamics and what shows here in red, in red colors, uh, is where uh, red and orange, where forest is being lost, uh, there's a net loss of forest in these areas. And then you have another area which looks green, which is a net gain of forest, that, that there are uh, most of the losses or significant part of the losses are in fact in the tropical domain. So it's an important part of climate change mitigation to reduce that source. But it's also an important uh, part of the climate change mitigation activities that we actually try to enhance the sink, so have more forests or increase the capability of forests to actually take up carbon from the atmosphere. And in that sense, from a climate change mitigation perspective, and forests are almost unique in that sense, is you can actually reduce the source, the source of carbon to the source is meant when you have a release of carbon to the atmosphere. Uh, this is the source, and you can reduce the source by reducing deforestation, reducing degradation, or you can enhance the sink, which means you can take up uh, uh, carbon stocks from the atmos atmosphere by, for example, planting more, more trees or by enabling forests to better take up carbon from the atmos atmosphere. And so you have a mitigation potential that is for both sinks and sources. And that is important. So it's a dual uh, mitigation objectives that one, one has. So this is all important, but in the previous climate agreement, in the Kyoto Protocol that was signed in 97, these tropical forests have not been part of that agreement. And it was only uh, in 2005 when uh, some of the developing countries stepped up to the UN Climate Convention and said, yes, we are willing to be part of an agreement. We are willing to take action to reduce deforestation and would like to contribute to mitigation of climate change. And that basically resulted in a mechanism called Red Plus. And it is basically, and I'm starting to use some of the political language then, policy approaches and positive incentives relating to what are shown here as the five Red Plus activities. Uh, and that's how Red Plus is also built up. It's reducing emissions from deforestation, that's the first D, reducing emission from forest degradation, that is the second D, and it includes the conservation of carbon stocks, the sustainable management of forest, and the enhancement of carbon stocks, which is usually referred to as the plus part, and basically should contribute to enhancing the sink capacity of the, of the forests. So basically Red Plus essentially means doing, practically doing, these five activities. 
when that was put on the table in 2005, there has been a long series of uh, uh, discussions, decisions, and negotiations on the political level. And these conferences of the parties, those are the annual meetings of the UN Climate Convention, makes has a certain set of decisions uh, that eventually led to the Paris Agreement that was signed in December 2015. Um, the Paris Agreement is not in that slide because it was actually after the, this module was developed. Uh, but what it did, it basically puts the different pieces to, together. And now Red Plus is formally, it almost has its own article in the Paris Agreement, is formally part of the new climate agreement that has just been signed. So what, whatever has been decided on Red Plus in the, uh, in the methodological but also in the technical sense is now part of the new climate ag agreement. And so that's why Paris is very different than Kyoto. Uh, it's different in many ways, but in particular for tropical countries, it means that the tropical forests are now part of the climate deal. If you then talk about how these incentives of Red Plus affect the way we should monitor forests, we should particularly look at what was decided at COP19 in Warsaw. Uh, that was 2013, because that's where a lot of the technical details on uh, or requirements uh, on how and uh, uh, on how to do forest monitoring in these countries for Red Plus has been decided. So then let's let's look into that in a bit more detail. Um, so in terms of the Red Plus mechanisms, parties should collectively aim to slow hold or reverse forest cover and carbon loss. And basically doing that through addressing or through doing these five red plus activities. The participation is kind of voluntary, uh, although with the Paris Agreement, that is, I think, a bit more, it's a bit more requesting than voluntary part of participation. But it's in accordance with their respective capacities and national circumstances. Um, red plus is very much driven by the notion of performance-based payments. So it's related to, and that's the last point here on that slide, and that's a very important one, that Red Plus results uh, or the actions that are taken to so these five Red Plus activities, they should be measured, reported, and verified. And that basically means you should do these activities and you should be able to report what you did and what the impact of these activities are on the climate at the end. So these measured, reported, and verified, that is MRV, and you hear a lot about MRV in the Red Plus context, and that basically means the measuring, reporting, and verification of the activities uh, of these five Red Plus activi activities. And so based on these MRV, you would actually uh, but if that MRV shows performance, and performance is basically defined as the difference between the actual emissions or removals and a reference level, so some benchmark that is assuming what would happen without Red Plus compared to that what was actually achieved with Red Plus. And so the difference between what would have been in terms without Red Plus versus what you have achieved with Red Plus, that would be related to the performance-based payment. The, um, the benchmark uh, is commonly referred to as the reference level or the reference emission level. And the uh, performance assessment is done through a regular performance reporting, so an MRV, uh, for example, through the biannual update reports that the countries will have to pro provide. To do measuring, reporting, and verification, to do MRV, you do require a national forest monitoring system. And that's why we have been talking about both MRV and national forest monitoring systems. But having good forest monitoring is, in essence, a very important part of your Red Plus mechanism in the country. There's further guidance uh, from the UN Climate Convention uh, that what, co what countries should do. So countries should develop a national strategy or an action, an action plan. So what activities are to be taken up that should address the trials of deforestation. And if you see, for example, links to other modules here, those are modules that are part of these Goxy Gold trading materials. There is, for example, a whole module that's dealing with drivers of deforestation, 
and for example, there is a whole module on how to do and set a national forest reference or reference emission level. But basically, a country is supposed to have a national strategy or action plan. So what you're actually doing in terms of your five red plus activities. You have to have a robust and transparent national forest monitoring system. You have to develop a forest reference level or forest reference emission level. And you have to have some uh, system to providing information on the safeguards. Uh, Red Plus is assumed to be implemented in a phased approach uh, that basically allows them to gradually engage and build capacities and actually move towards a full implementation. Sorry, full implementation uh, for Red Plus. The, fir the first phase is what's so called the, red the readiness phase, where you would develop a national strategy, an action plan, um, think about policies and measures, and do capacity development, in particular also for the for the MRVs or for the monitoring activities. Uh, phase two will then transition to implementation, so doing demonstration, build your monitoring system, test out different uh, incentive schemes, uh, and really invest in learning from the demonstration activities. And phase three is then basically a full implementation where you move national, uh, where you do actually really aim for these results-based uh, uh, performance reporting. Also, the monitoring system should basically, basically be in, in, in full operation there. Um, in terms of national force monitoring systems, there are some specific guidance on, on that, um, that it should build upon existing systems. So every situation, every country situation is different. You should build upon what you have. Uh, you have to be able to assess different forest types. Uh, we need this notion of continuous improvement. Uh, so these following this phased approach is quite central uh, uh, to the to the way countries should address the uh, these, basically this continuous way of building their their capacities. And uh, we will have we will talk more about that in the in the second part of the presentation today. So then, if you think about uh, the National Forest Monitoring System, and that's actually nicely shown in that figure that you see on this slide, is the National Forest Monitoring System is much, tends to be much broader than just Red Plus. And the, the National Forest Monitoring System has a monitoring function and an MOV function. And the MOV function is basically what do you have to do to measure, report, and verify your actions on Red Plus. This is very much focused on uh, on carbon, on your red plus activities, and the way you report your performance to the international level. It's, it's very driven by these requirements, but in that sense it's quite narrow in terms of the objectives. Whereas the monitoring functions where you have different variables uh, that may include other things than just carbon, uh, it may be well in harmonization with other important forest monitoring mandates or, or activities that you have on, ongoing. Um, so that you're thinking about it more as an almost like a natural resource monitoring uh, system as, as part of that. And ideally, those things should be well integrated. And it's important that building a national forest zone monitoring system just for Red Plus uh, is probably too narrow because, first of all, there are lots of other benefits. And secondly, long-term sustainability of such systems, it's much enhanced if you can serve multiple purposes. In terms of and those are all things that where you find a certain climate change convention decision behind these. Is there are some guidance on the drivers of deforestation that should be assessed and should become part of the national strategy and action plans. There are some guidance on how to deal with safeguards um, and how to uh, build safeguard information systems. I'm not going to go in more detail on, on that. There are specific modalities on how to set forest reference emission levels or forest reference levels. Um, they are basically the benchmark for uh, each country uh, in assessing the performance. Um, and if you look uh, what countries are doing at this point in time, they uh, Red Plus countries, they are quite busy in preparing and submitting their forest reference levels to the UN Climate Convention. I think to date about 15 or 16 countries have already submitted forest reference emission levels or forest reference levels to the UN Climate Con Convention as basically as the first estimate of the benchmark, uh, basically before Red Plus uh, and Red Plus performance reporting is started. Um, 
their, the reference level should be expressed in tons of CO2 equivalent per, per year. And what's quite important is these reference levels should be consistent with your national greenhouse gas inventories. Uh, and that's quite important so that you have uh, on the one hand the whole red plus agenda and the forest monitoring. On the other hand, you have a national greenhouse gas inventory which you also have to report to the UN Climate Convention, and that includes all sectors, so the fossil fuel sectors, but also the land use sector, and you should really develop that in close collaboration. Um, it should be transparent, it should take into account historical data, because this is a reference level, that's something before, so you might want to use, for example, historical rates of deforestation and related em 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 emissions. But by nature, these reference levels are forward-looking, so it's about what would happen without Red Plus, and so there is some possibility for adjusting for national circumstances, if that, if that makes, makes sense. They may be improved over, over time, um, so many countries that have submitted now their reference level, there is an expectation that if you incorporate better, better data, improve the method, methodologies. And these reference levels are subject to technical assessment. That technical assessment is organized by the UN Climate Convention, by the Rostov Export Data, and I've mentioned 15 countries have actually submitted uh, their reference level to the UN Climate Convention, and uh, they are currently being ass assessed. And that's, many countries actually see it as a process to get some feedback, huh, to get some um, uh, feedback from the set of international experts, what the reference level is, 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 is about, is it transparent, uh, is it understandable, is it legit, and, and I think that's an important process, a very interactive process that is happening as we, as we speak. There are also mod modalities for measuring, reporting, and verification, which is MR, 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 MRV. What is quite important is that uh, it needs to be well consistent with the reference level uh, and that you basically compare, you can compare as part of that your emissions, your actual emissions with Red Plus reductions before, uh, with the actual reference level, right? And so that is basically what MOV at the end does. So then let's go a bit more then, now that we've went through the various decisions, the various backgrounds, let's move on and go a bit to the IPCC Good Practice Guidelines. Because the, 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 what the UN Climate Convention provides is, is more these generic guidance requirements, the basic things that you should do. Um, but what it also says is if you actually report um, if you actually do put together your forest-related emissions and removals, there are already guidelines available uh, under the UN Climate Convention on how to actually do that. And those are the IPCC Good Practice Guidelines. Um, there is generic guidance there, so of course you should identify your land use and forestry activities uh, that are important, that you want to re report on. Um, that you use a combination of remote sensing and carbon and ground-based carbon inventory approaches to estimate, and that's very important now, anthropogenic forest-related greenhouse gas emissions and removals, forest carbon stocks and forest area changes. And that's an important fundamental requirement that the purpose of these national greenhouse gas inventories is to report anthropogenic forest-related uh, or any kind of human related uh, emissions and removals. Uh, so it's not so much about the natural fluxes uh, that you have in forests or the natural carbon stock changes, it's about how humans alter uh, the carbon stocks and, uh, and, uh, and the carbon, carbon, carbon pools. So these IPCC good practice guidelines, there's a whole suite of them available. They exist for all the sectors. They have been developed in response to the Kyoto Protocol, and uh, they are quite lengthy and quite detailed, but they basically give you an accounting framework. The most important ones for Red Plus are the 2003 Good Practice Guidelines for Land Use, Land Use Change, and Forestry. Uh, that is an acronym that is often referred to as LULUCF, so if you see LULUCF, it refers to these um, 2003 Good Practice Guidance. There is an update of that, which is called Guidelines, it's formally a bit less strong, which is these AFOLUs, these agriculture, forestry, and other land uses, and countries may decide which one they actually use, but for the forest sector they are quite complementary. Um, 
if you really like to understand a lot of details on how to use the IPCC good, IPCC good practice guidance uh, for Red Plus, I would refer you as one of the background documents. There is the GFOI MGD, the Methods and Guidance document that's available. That's the 2014. There's a new version that just became available that really helps you to walk you through how you can use these guidelines for Red, Red Plus in a lot of more detail. So that's, a, that's an advice I would like to give. Because again, this is a framework uh, that we are basically op operating in. So one of these uh, good practice guidelines tell you. Well, first of all, there are principles. And there are five principles. First of all, your national greenhouse gas inventory should be consistent. And consistent largely refers they should have used the same definitions and methodologies over space and time. Uh, very, very important. Um, comparability. You should use some standard methodologies and form, format that are provided by the IPCC and agreed within uh, the UN Climate uh, Convention cont context. It should be transparent so people can reproduce what you actually did for your greenhouse gas inventory. So the assumptions, methodologies, clearly explained and appropriately docu documented. It should be accuracy, so it should be accurate, so they should be, what the statistics we call, unbiased. So they should be neither over nor underestimated and uncertainties should be reduced as far as practical. And they should be complete. So they should include all the agreed categories, uh, so activity categories, for example, all the different gases. Uh, of course, we have, uh, other, we have CO2 as the most important trace gas, but some, in particular, the land in the agriculture sector and some of the other stuff, we have a lot of issues with met methane or N2O, and so that may be an important part there. But also for all the pools, so these different carbon carbon pools and all uh, geographical areas. So those are the guiding principles, and you will see them well reflected in the more detailed methodological guidance that is actually given. Uh, from my experience, um, uh, the issues, in particular in the in a developing country context, uh, the issues of consistency and transparency are are very very important. So one important accounting rule that you have to decide on in also for your IPCC good practice guidelines of course definition and that's a long discussion um, uh, and basically um, each country has some flexibility on how they would can define their, 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 deforest, their forests and as they define their forests they will also define on what is non-forest and then uh, a land use change or a deforestation is a conversion of a forest to a non-forest. So the forest definition determines a lot on what you define as deforestation. Um, countries may have their own definitions. Uh, the UNFC might have explanations uh, that if the, uh, the, the definition varies, for example, from that of the FAO or, or from other certain things. Um, uh, so if you start to develop your reference level or you start to develop your national forest monitoring system and your MLB, the deciding on the forest definition is quite important. There's quite some flexibility that a country has. So for example, the usual thresholds that you have in terms of minimum forest area, so the minimum mapping unit basically, the crown cover, so what's the minimum crown cover, is it 10%, 20%, 30%, or what's the minimum height of, 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 of trees? Thus, you can decide and um, a country may, may have already a definition in that they may want to use. What often causes a lot of issues around the definition is whether you include, include and exclude plantation forests or, for example, which type of plantations you include as forests and non. For example, is oil palm rather a crop or is it a tree? Uh, in fact, there is, a, there is some flexibility on how you can do that. Uh, and, and you have to account uh, if you decide, for example, to have all palm as part of forest as trees. You would have to report the carbon stock changes within those uh, within forest areas. Mostly, plant, like oil palm would be a crop, and then a conversion of forest to an oil palm would be called a deforestation, and you have to account the carbon stocks for that. What is also very important is that you have some information 
on what you may call a natural forest. Uh, and that's something that uh, is maybe uh, not explicitly mentioned in the MRV discussion, but in particular when it comes to natural, uh, national forest monitoring systems. And so um, it's important that you have an idea and that's really to separate out planted forests versus natural forests, for example, uh, because they, have a, they are very different in terms of their carbon and carbon stock dynamics, but they're also very different in terms of the safeguards and biodiversity co-benefits co and so on. So that's, that, those are important considerations that you might want to take into account in the forest definition. So in terms of the, actually estimating the carbon em emissions, the basic concept of the IPCC good practice guideline is explained in that, um, that equation. Uh, and don't get scared, it's quite a simple equ equation. You have basically two factors. Um, to get to the gross emission of carbon from, from uh, deforestation, what you have what's called activity data. And the activity data is basically the area of deforestation in hectares. Right? So it's, it's, that's the usual information that you would get from remote sensing a satellite data analysis. What is the area of deforestation? And this first factor is called activity data because this is the actual area of human activity that is causing deforestation. The second part is the carbon loss which is the change in carbon stock per unit, per unit area, and that's called the emission factor. And that's basically how much biomass or how much carbon do you use a loss, lose when you clear the forest. And in the case of a clear-cut deforestation, that's basically almost all the biomass that was originally there is cleared, and you basically go from a, the initial forest biomass to almost zero. Um, uh, to basically uh, uh, get an idea of the emission factor. So if you then take the activity data and multiply it with the emission factor, you get actually two emissions. So if you have uh, uh, an area of deforestation of 100 hectares, and these 100 hectares of forest that have been cleared have an average of 100 tons of carbon, uh, you multiply 100 hectares by 100 tons on average, so you get to 10,000 uh, 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 tons of carbon as gross emission from deforestation. That's the basic concept on how you actually estimate emissions using the IPCC Good Practice Guideline frame Framework. Activity data and emission factors. And it's what you will hear a lot in the discussions around how to best monitor these variables is you have an estimation for activity data and you have estimations for emission factors. And they often actually come from different data sources. Um, so basically, uh, you have basically advice and more details, and I think also in this webinar series you will get more information on actually how to get data to underpin, underpin these estim estimations. So in terms of the activity data, the IPC Good Practice Guidelines has three what they call approaches, um, and um, the. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because basically what is recommended for to use for Red Plus is, in particular if you use remote sensing data, is approach 3, which allows a tracking of land use conversion on a spatially explicit basis. And then basically you can have changes between the categories, you can derive a change matrix, you can actually derive growth uh, tra transitions from, 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 from that. And that is basically different than if you would use basically a national inventory a national survey or even only estimating net land changes uh, which would be something you would do for the forest resources assessment. So in terms of activity data for forest change we're talking about approach 3 following approach 3 of the IPCC good practice guidelines. Then when we come to emission factors and the issue of biomass is that uh, biomass is basically defined as the mass of unit area above ground or below ground of plant material. Um, for, for converting biomass to carbon, you have to basically take the, the carbon fraction of that biomass. That on average is about 47%. So 47% of the life biomass is in fact carbon. So if you have a biomass estimation, you basically multiply it by the carbon fraction, which is on average uh, 0 0.47 to get to carbon stocks. Um, there are several ways to actually measure biomass. Uh, there's only one direct way of doing it. That means you cut a tree, you dry it, and weigh it. 
uh, and that's a direct, and you have a direct me measurement of biomass. And of course, since we want to conserve forests, uh, not cut them to measure them, uh, that's not you cannot do that, at least not a lot. So we have to infer that from non-destructive uh, estimations, and there are basically uh, classical forest inventory approaches, uh, for example, using estimates of dBH and height, using allometric equations, various conversion factors to actually get to biomass and get to um, and get to carbon carbon stocks. Or you can also have an inference from uh, remote sensing or even some modeling uh, in, in, in some instances. But perhaps the most important and most practical source to actually get to biomass data is to use on the ground estimations using DBH and height. Some increasingly remote sensing plays a role there as, as well, uh, but that's on the verge of, of, of being researched, maybe becoming operational. Perhaps something that you also hear a bit more about in the, in the remainder of the, of the webinar series. Um, in terms of the emission factors, we have to keep in mind that we have several pools. Uh, I already mentioned them. So, uh, biomass is only the above ground biomass is only one of the pools. There's also below ground biomass, which is basically the root bio biomass that is often estimated as a as a as a root to shoot or ratio or as a kind of a fraction of the above ground biomass. The other pools, deadwood and litter, can also be important. Uh, uh, you can actually decide whether it's worthwhile to estimate those, uh, and that can be done using what the IPC calls key category anal analysis. Um, uh, so basically, is is it worth basically to measure the pool, giving the importance uh, important of contribution to the total emissions and removal it has, and the same basically holds for the soil pool as well. Um, to estimate emission factors. The IPCC has considered different tiers, uh, and uh, these tiers uh, vary in a certain way. So tier one uh, is uh, for countries and for situations where you have no uh, measurements, uh, and is basically saying that uh, you can use the IPCC good practice guidelines, which give you default factors in case you have no data. So those are in the guidelines. So if you don't know what the biomass is in a certain country and you have no measurements, the IPCC can give you some default numbers on what that is. They are basically from literature and put together in that. And that's what's commonly called as tier one. Um, you would also use tier one in, uh, in estimating carbon pools that are not significant, that are not important. So for example, in your country, if the litter pool is not very important, uh, you can use tier one to estimate that. Don't have to invest in mon monitoring, but if it is significant, and that's particularly the case for above ground biomass, for for example, you have to, you are encouraged to use at least tier tier two, and tier two is basically country specific data for key factors, um, and they have to be measured. So tier two means you have actually done measurements in your country, uh, for example, from inventories, from permanent plots, and then there's tier three, which basically means you have a detailed inventory of various pools and you have actually repeated measurements over uh, your carbon pools over time. You may include some modeling in that, so it's a, it's a more complex distinction between, um, between different fluxes and the different transfer of carbon among the different pools. Um, the differentiation between Tier 2 and Tier 3 is not always very clear. In fact, uh, countries often use a combination uh, of, 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 of those. But these discussion on tiers, whether to use tier one or tier two, and that you may actually uh, encounter those quite a bit, and be in, be aware that these come, these come from the IPC good practice guidelines, and therefore the assessing assessment of emission factors. Um, in terms of actually the estimate the emissions, there are two fundamental methods to do that. One is uh, called gain loss. The other one is stock change. Uh, I'm just going to mention them here because there's a whole module in explaining that. And the gain loss, you basically you have an initial carbon stock, and you only look what's coming in and what's going out uh, in terms of so in terms of a forest, you could say how much did the forest grow or regrow in a certain period, and how much was actually taken out, for example, by selective ex extraction to get the gains and the losses. Or you can have a stock change method, which means you have independent measurements over, over time. So you go and measure at multiple points in time, or you have two full 
comparable national forest in inventories and you really look at the stock change among, among those. Uh, there's a tendency that, in particular for tropical situations, the gain loss method is, 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 is generally applicable, in particular when it comes to biomass. Then, uh, this is also from the IPC Good Practice Guide, the different pools and how the different transfer of pools can actually happen. So, above ground biomass, uh, particularly if you cut it, it can go directly to the atmosphere, it can actually move to dead wood, it eventually goes to the atmosphere. Here are the different transfers among the different pools that are actually possible. Um, there is, and I'm going to uh, speed a bit up to make sure that. Uh, um, but there is a, there's a whole set of modules on that as well. There are different transfers that are possible, certain transfers are not possible, and between the different pools. And so uh, this is information, this is the kind of information you will get from the IPCC Good Practice, practice Guidelines. So it's actually quite useful um, to actually look into that. It, it tells you a lot on what to do and what not to, not to do in terms of your estimation. Um, so, and then I would like to come to a close uh, for the first part of the webinar that we have basically uh, seen that tropical forests are an important part of the climate change equation. Um, they are subject to, they have been subject to negotiation under the UN Climate Convention under a process called Red Plus. They have certain set of decisions that relate to the policy part of it, but also to the monitoring part of it, which is an important part of, of red, red, red Plus. And so countries are encouraged to do Red Plus. They are encouraged to build capacities to measure report on the five Red Plus ac activities and the carbon pools defined by the I IPC, IPCC. Um, and to do that, countries need to build up national forest monitoring system. And as part of that national forest monitoring system, countries should be able to measure, report, and verify their Red Plus ac activities. Um, uh, as said, there is more guidance on that, more, much more practical guidance on how to do that uh, in the uh, Gotsi Gold source book, but also in the GFI guidance doc document. The links are also provided. Um, and in the second part, we're going to particularly talk about how to set up a national forest monitoring systems. I would also give you a, a bit of hint that if you are interested, there are also certain country examples and exercises that you could do as part of these modules. They are not part of the webinar series, so don't conf confuse that. Um, so just to give you some guidance there. And then there are some recommended follow-up uh, modules that you can, you can do, but this is part of the Gossico modules. Good. With that, I like to stop for now. I said the second part will uh, talk about building national forest monitoring systems for Red Plus. Um, goes a bit more into the, the country context. Um, I would propose that we have a very short break, two minutes. Uh, people want to get up, stretch, uh, have, a, have something to drink, go to the bathroom, um, and then let's be back in about two minutes, uh, and then we will start with the second, with the second part. Okay, so. Hope everybody took the opportunity to uh, well reflect a bit on what we've heard so far. Uh, perhaps stretch a bit, clear your mind a little bit, um, uh, because we are up for a second part. And as uh, was said by by as Amber, that we will answer some questions. Uh, I already see some in interesting questions that being 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 raised. So we will have time in the end to actually respond to them. Um, and all of the material that I've shown and. Um, the modules, the guidance document, the IPCC good practice guidelines, all of the stuff is freely available on, online. So all of the stuff, there's nothing here that is not, not accessible. And so, uh, and so please, uh, if you look for these materials, I think all the web links should be there and can be used uh, further by you. In fact, the IPCC good practice guidelines, and I'm starting to start with the next module to go through these background materials because some of them actually are quite similar. Um, they are quite lengthy, huh? and so uh, uh, it's even worthwhile maybe if, if you think about the country, you can actually order a binder uh, where all of these are av available because uh, if you really want to use them in practice. Good, okay. So in the second part, we're going to talk about how to, do, how to actually build a national forest monitoring system.
And in the lecture, the first part is on the UNFCC requirements, which is, of course, a bit repetitive. So I'm going to go through that a bit, bit, bit faster and focus a bit more on the second part, which is on the framework, building capacity, the planning and the implementation for such a setup, and talk a bit about costs, particularly for the purpose of remote, remote, remote sensing. Um, so in terms of the UNFCC requirements, uh, we have already heard that this is about result-based actions that should be fully measured, reported, and very, very verified. To MRV, you have to have a national forest monitoring system that's robust and transparent, and you have to develop a reference level and a forest reference emission level. Uh, and basically, you need data uh, to do that. Um, these systems, these national forest monitoring systems, they don't should, should not start from scratch. Uh, so each country has a different starting point uh, on where they have in terms of their uh, capacities, in terms of historical uh, uh, data, a way they have done forest monitoring in the past. That should be inter inter integrated because there is not a need to start fully from scratch if we have already good capacity in, in place. Um, the national forest monitoring should use a combination of remote sensing and ground-based forest carbon invent inventory. Um, and uh, we already heard that perhaps in terms of the activity data, that's where remote sensing provides the prominent data source in terms of the ground-based forest carbon inventory. They are largely being used to uh, do the emission factors. Um, the estimates should be transparent, consistent, uh, and as far as possible accu accurate. Uh, and, of course, taking into account national capability and capacities, because what you will be providing, for example, to the UN Climate Convention uh, for review, uh, for assessment, uh, is, uh, should actually explain uh, uh, where you are in the process also of capacity development, where do you see uh, still some areas of improvement, and, and how do you plan, plan, to, plan to do that. Um, in terms of the framework, Bit too fast. I already showed that, that slide that you actually have to think about your national forest monitoring as, as something being of broader value than just for uh, Red Plus. Uh, the specific need for Red Plus has to be part of that, uh, but of course there are broader issues that you can address with that for well. For example, the MRV function is a very specific Red Plus driven uh, uh, way you do the monit monit monitoring. Uh, but the monitoring functions. If you do remote sensing of your national forest, if you do work with communities and with forest managers on the, on the, on the ground, if you do want to link your biodiversity monitoring or all the other things that you have in terms of your domestic needs for forest mon monitoring, uh, water resources and other things, please make sure you integrate that as well. Because the more value you take out of your forest monitoring data, uh, uh, the better and the more sustainable these ag ag activities are. So that, that's a complex slide, uh, but it shows that uh, the National Forest Monitoring System has to be well integrated with these various parts. Because in terms of plus, in terms of Red Plus, you have a national strategy and an implementation plan. You want to do something, and so your know, National Forest Monitoring should be uh, uh, feeding into these into this national strategy, because if you want to have a national strategy, for example, to reduce deforestation or reduce degradation, you need to understand what deforestation and what degradation is happening. What are the, the drivers of, of that if you want to do something about, about that? But in terms of the priorities these strategies set out, they should also determine your priorities in terms of the National Forest Monitoring for Red Plus. Whatever you do in terms of national forest monitoring system should be well integrated also with your national greenhouse gas invent, inventor, inventory. Um, so those also using the IPCC good practice guidelines, and that is also something you have been obliged to do. And as I already mentioned, also the reference level, for example, that you propose for Red Plus needs to be consistent with your national greenhouse gas in, inventory. So at, at the end, it's important that you evolve your national forest monitoring, your uh, your M M M will be very much in line with your national strategy and plan for Red Plus and this related activities and with your national greenhouse gas inventor in, 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 in inventory. So coordination is, is very um, important. Um, so 
It's important, of course, uh, in particular when it comes to setting a reference level that you need a set of historical forest and forest area changes. Uh, and that's where remote sensing actually becomes important because if you don't have uh, suitable historical forest monitoring data, you cannot go back in time. But luckily we have uh, a whole bunch of remote sensing archives of satellite images that have been acquired in, in, in the past that give us some information on actually tracking forest area and forest area changes uh, and compare them between uh, historical and, and future deforestation and degradation rates. So this is, we would say it is the primary source uh, to measure forest area changes, which is basically deforestation and reforestation. Uh, it can actually help to uh, address some areas affected by forest degradation. Forest degradation monitoring is is of course more complex because it's we're talking about various processes. We're talking about very small, subtle de degradation processes, for example, fuel collection, understory re removal, and all the way to selective logging or, or all kinds of things, which are more easily detected using uh, remote sensing data. And uh, what is also very important that if you do um, estimations uh, from remote sensing on your forest area changes for deforestation and reforestation, you can actually uh, take an additional step and, for example, look in what is the if I look at the deforested area. What's the land use that has been following that deforestation? Is it an agricultural field? Are we talking about oil palm? Is it forest plant, forest plantation? Is nothing happening afterwards that the forest is re 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 growing? And that's important to assess the proximate drivers of deforestation. But it's also important to actually get a better understanding on the on the on the carbon dynamics. Um, if you use remote sensing for the national forest monitoring, you have to be realize there are a couple of particular challenges. In particular, if you use optical data in the tropics, we do have an issue with cloud cover. Um, the archives that we have now from the optical data are much more dense uh, now than we had in the past. So the chances of having cloud-free data are much higher than uh, before. Still, you can have areas of persist persistent cloud cover, and there is where you might want to use uh, radar, uh, so active remote sensing system using uh, microwaves that are not affected by clouds and can help you as an additional data, data, data source. <coughs> Sorry, uh, but I'm sure you will hear about that uh, in the later part of that webinar. You also have to think about seasonality. Uh, uh, if you're talk, talking about uh, the central tropics, uh, there is not much of seasonality there. But for example, if you move towards the dry forests and uh, other forests, you have seasonality there and you have to take that into account because if you have leave off conditions of these forests, it's hard to separate them from uh, non forest areas. So you want to make, make sure you can take that into account. Um, topography is an important part. Usually, if you have Topography, it makes your estimation or your mapping for remote sensing more complicated. Uh, there are some ways to deal with that, uh, but uh, it's, 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 it's easier to map forest changes in flat areas than, than those in, 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 in terrain, so be aware of that. And then, of course, uh, there is an issue with actually accessing the data. It's nice that we have a lot of free and open data archives now, um, uh, but the, you have to access them uh, and the more data the more data you actually have to access and uh, that has been an issue that uh, accessing the full archives in some of the countries is an, is an issue uh, there are some ways of being uh, you know you can work with partners that you know bring the data that can there can be ways of doing cloud com computing so different kind of solutions that are that countries have found ways to, to deal with that but that is an issue that you actually that's a technical challenge that you that you have to have to face. Um, then let's talk a bit about the technical and institutional capacity. And uh, we know from the past that uh, if in particular if you look at how uh, developed countries uh, and also some of the um, uh, countries that have good national greenhouse gas development uh, national greenhouse gas already, uh, for example Mexico, uh, China. Uh, of Brazil is that actually having a good um, setup in terms of the national forest monitors is very important uh, for their uh, uh, for basic the long term sustainability. So if you set up your national forest monitoring system, you have to keep in mind that you have requirements 
for monitoring forest carbon on the national level that are basically, for example, I want to report using the IPCC, IPCC good practice guidelines to Red Plus. Um, that, that is a certain requirement and that, that should be driving your things. You may have others as, as well. You really have to look what are the existing cap capacities for national forest monitoring. Also, in particular, when it comes to remote sensing, do I have remote sensing expert expertise? Where is it in my country? Is the capacity strong enough to do maybe a reprocessing of the historical data I have? Can I provide a sustained data stream from now on to the to the future to 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 provide provide that? Um, you also have to take account particular requirements. For example, do I have a lot of forest fires? Uh, and forest fires uh, do require maybe some additional remote sensing analysis need to be done. How important is my soil carbon pool? Uh, uh, and that is particularly the case for areas where you have a lot of tropical peatlands, for, for example, such as in uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, but also part of the, uh, of the, um, the Amazon. Um, where you may have high soil carbon uh, that maybe you want to take into, uh, take into account. So then if you look at the capacities that the countries have and what's shown in this map, is a, it's a map of capacity gaps. So the basically the, the the gap is larger. The, the 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 basically the less sufficient data a country has. That analysis is already a couple of years old. But the point I would like to make here is there are countries who have a very small gap. So they have already quite good capacities, which basically shows that the capacities can be established. It can be done. And uh, there are good examples of using remote sensing and ground-based approaches together to do national greenhouse gas inventories for, for forests. And there is learning that can be done from these kinds of cases. But you also see that in other cases you have quite low capacities. And this is a variability that you have, and that has to be taken into account. And if you look at the variability in capacities, and you look that the engagement of Red Plus is quite high, and that's basically shown in blue, uh, is that the starting point for the countries is actually quite different. And so that is also why we have this issue of uh, um, this phased approach. So you can start from whatever you have, you can improve your system over, over time, and that basically uh, it, it, can, it is acknowledged that countries do have very different start and starting points and should not be shy to can actually have a low level starting point even because the data, the technologies, the guidelines, the capacity development strategies are there to actually build these, um, and that's very important. In terms of the so in terms of these phases, and that's basically uh, that what I just repeated again. You have these phases of readiness, of transition to and demonstration, and eventually the full implementation. And for countries uh, that maybe start a bit lower, this phasing will take a bit 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 longer, but. Uh, you will learn along the long the long the way, and the goal is pretty clear where you want to end up. It's basically a phase three full implementation, including a full op operational uh, national forest monitoring system. So, in terms of uh, MOV coordination, uh, it's also quite important that uh, that if you build a system, you coordinate well. Uh, in the international level, I mentioned there is some country experience, some good country experience in how it can actually be done. So South-South collaboration, uh, if you are a country, look, at, look around. Uh, there's a lot of things that can be learned or maybe able to, to learn from the, from, the various, uh, from the various neighboring countries. Um, there's also, for example, the technical com community is providing guidance on how to do that. In fact, you can think almost about what I'm doing here is, is it falls in that category. So developing these these guidelines, documents, developing the training materials, providing the kind of support. I think that's uh, that's that's part of part of part of that. Um, it's important to also be coordinated with the national strategy. Uh, so these MOV or the Red Plus policy priorities. Uh, oftentimes the solutions to, uh, for example, the particular deforestation lie outside the forest sector. So I mean, a lot of deforestation is driven, in fact, by the agricultural sector. And so these multi-sector partner partnerships are quite, um, quite important. And it's also quite important to think about um, coordinating multi-donor support. I think the, will the willingness uh, of countries uh, to provide you know, readiness support to build capacities is quite high. And 
I think it's good to, to have a good strategy on the country level so you can actually coordinate well with the support that you can get from the, from the various sides. And there's, of course, a subnational com component. Uh, it's, of course, very much of a national monitoring when it comes to reporting to the international level. But if you think about using your forest monitoring data as a policy tool to stimulate activities uh, locally, you have to also link your monitoring system to, to subnational levels, to stakeholders, uh, to forest managers, to actors that are actually doing red, red, red plus to have a, to have a good, good, good exchange of that. So, for example, there's been quite some uh, discussions on the community involvement in monitoring, for example, that would fall under that category. So, in terms of the institutional frame, framework, uh, that's very um, important. Um, there should be the right partnerships and collaboration should be in there. It should be very coordinated and integrated. Uh, and there should be some kind of a national technical committee that is steering that. You should have a national data management system, the right infra infra infrastructure that is very important also for data sharing, for creating transparency, for creating engage engagement. Um, you have to have good communication mechanisms. Um, and you actually have to think about how you engage with the local and also with the international uh, responsibility uh, with the in, in international com community as, as part of part of that. So, um, for example, there should be some kind of a national coordination and steering body, maybe with an advisory board uh, that maybe can include civil society organizations, research organizations, international partners, and so and so on. And there should be some kind of a central way of storing and registering the data and linking that, for example, to a national carbon registry, maybe link to your national greenhouse gas inventories. So those are all things you probably have to con consider when uh, thinking about the setup of a national forest monitoring system. So then if you want to do it in practice, there's some guidance that uh, can, be, can be given. And... Um, the uh, method and guidance document of the GO4i gives you a good example of that. Uh, there is some flowchart that is available in the source book, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to use that one uh, to help you, to help you guide uh, through that through that process. So you would have an initial set of uh, actions which, where you define your objectives on design. You have then a part which is about establishing the monitoring system, and then you have a part that actually feeds the data uh, into the uh, and the estimations into a certain analysis and, and reporting. So in the beginning, in terms of objectives of design, you can ask questions to all my key national stakeholders to extend UN, uh, the UNFCCC red process, the IPCC good practice, practice guidelines. Do I have my partners in, 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 on, on board? And if that's not, I have to do some capacity development. Do I have to write institutional framework and the capacity ex exists? If that not, that's not, not, uh, not the case, you will have to do, the, do that. And then is, is my forest uh, monitoring system complete and accurate enough to actually support my Red Plus implementation? And if that's not the case, you can go on to ask a series of, um, uh, of questions and uh, or try to check on a couple of technical issues. So in terms of that phase, the first phase, you design a national monitoring framework, you develop a plan for capacity development that includes long-term imp improvement of, of the system, and that should also a good planning on the resources and the, for the training and the capacity development that you, and the mechanisms on how to, how to, how to do that. Then you move, move on, for example, uh, for the second part, which is more the establishment of this, the system, um, in case my, your data are not complete and accurate and enough. So, for example, do I have consistent multi-date forest area change data? Yes or no. Do I have the data on carbon emissions from land use change? Um, do I have data on the carbon emissions for changes in forests that remain forests? And if I talk about forests that remain forests, it means what are my changes within my forest area? So, for example, forest degradation would be carbon stock loss in forests, remaining forests, so what happens within forests, but also a, a, a regrowth of forest or a, a rehabilitation or, or some kind of re, uh, enhancement of carbon stocks would fall under the category on, in, in forest, remaining forest. So do I have enough data for that? 
do I have significant emissions from other pools, um, uh, for example, from soil carbon, from the other parts? If you don't have that, you can use tier one. Uh, if, you, if you have that, you have to invest in, in measurements. Uh, do I have significant emissions from biomass burnings or fire? Uh, I have to get additional data on, on, on that. Do I have all my error sources known and are the uncertainties qualified? Yes, yes or no. And uh, basically, you can uh, go, go on and ask a certain set of questions, and all of them you can basically translate into a certain set of capacity needs and a certain set of steps on how to do that capacity development. And then, I'm going to skip through that. Um, and then there is particular uh, monitoring in what's called, called in the establishment phase, so that's basically where you particularly build up the capacities to start a red plus, and that is particularly looking back in time. So you try to reprocess your historical data, get your historical uh, estimation uh, for your forest, uh, deforestation, reforestation, forest-related emissions that feed into the reference level, uh, and basically get a good understanding of your historical data. In, in part of that process, you would recruit, you would train people, to complete an uh, accuracy, and, uh, accuracy and error analysis. You would kind of do a test run of your, of your forest monitoring system and capacities, because then you should be able to continuously update the, uh, or in particular produce data uh, and estimations as you go, as you go along, in particular looking then ahead when your red plus imp imp implementation is actually ha happening. And then there's the last part, which is analysis and reporting. So do I have uh, enough information for this historical period? How am I ready to do for the, for the future? Do I have my reference emission level? And is that regularly up, updated? And then basically, does, do I have a good connection and a good link to, uh, uh, to my national greenhouse gas inventory? So there's a couple of, 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 of guidance um, that you can actually take from, from that. I just give one example. Uh, uh, there are examples of these capacity development road, roadmaps. Uh, a lot of the Forest Carp Partnership, RPP, our PIN kind of uh, uh, documents do have uh, basically a capacity development plan. This is the MRE roadmap for Ethiopia. You can also find it on, on, online, which basically has these seven different steps with a lot of detailed information on how to establish institutional arrangements, improve activity data, improve emission factors, uh, link to the greenhouse gas inventory, prepare for the MOV for your Red Plus acti activities, implement the program for continuous improvement and capacity development, and actually have it a linked part of the national strategy. And these basic, basic steps you almost find in all of these uh, capacity development, in all of these capacity development. Um, let's talk a bit about costs, and I'm going to focus particularly on the costs on the remote sensing. Um, so uh, there are several cost categories uh, that you might have heard of. There's opportunity costs, uh, transaction costs, and so on. These monitoring activities are largely transaction costs. And uh, particularly when you think about remote sensing, you have various costs. Uh, you have basically the costs of the satellite data. Uh, a lot of satellite data sources are or are free and open, in particular, you see, if you think about systems like Landsat, uh, also from the Europe, from the Sentinel satellites, the data are free and open, but you may still have to have some costs that you have to apply to actually access the data and process them. You have costs related to the software and the hardware, uh, the office resources, you have to actually store the archive and these kind of things. You have costs for the human resources, for the interpretation, the ana ana analysis. You have monitoring and capacity development in the red, red, readiness phase, which includes a lot of initial investments. Usually, if you have done the initial investments, the costs go down uh, in a, if you go to an op op operational system. Uh, and then you have to include costs for the accuracy assessment and perhaps have some costs, in particular when you talk about exchange in terms of on the, on the regional uh, uh, and also to the international level. Satellite data, as I said, the ones that are most important are basically free of charge. Uh, there is, those are the ones, I'm just going to skip through that because we're going to hear about that a bit more. There's quite a number of them free of charge and free and open that can be used. Landsat, Seaburst, the Sentinel uh, data here in the optical domain from Europe. You have uh, uh, some of the radar data now uh, also free and, free and open. Uh, so you have quite a, quite a choice that, that you can uh, make there. So basically, 
In summary, also closing the second part, uh, and uh, is that you have to establish a national forest monitoring system that is. Uh, and that's one function of that is to actually do measuring, reporting, and verification of red, red plus. Um, the strong institutional framework is actually quite important. Uh, in fact, you could argue it's probably the most important part, given that from a technical point of view, it can be done. I mean, there is capacities needed, there are challenges, uh, but from experience, it's very important uh, that the institutional uh, setup is is clear and, and is an important factor in the, in, the, in the functioning of a national forest monitoring system. You do require some kind of roadmap uh, for actually building these capacities because Red Plus poses new requirements on national forest monitoring systems. And keep in mind these three Red Plus phases uh, that you have to actually move and improve the system over, over, over time. Um, there are different factors uh, in terms of cost to be considered particularly in the establishment phase and the readiness phase, demonstration phase, where you have to probably invest much more capacity development, whereas if you actually have an operation that, that runs, uh, where the costs actually go down. And um, I think it would be time to move on to some of the questions. Uh, yes, and so that question is, are, is this MRV basically for all types globally? In general, the guide is, is, is yes, because the aim of the uh, of the Paris Agreement, so to say, is that all forests on our part and uh, should contribute to, to climate change mitigation, in fact adaptation too, but let's talk about mitigation because that's what, what we talk about here. And so the IPCC Good Practice Guidelines are generically for all forest types. Uh, it is of course uh, the case that if you monitor changes in a tropical forest or you monitor changes in uh, a European forest or North American forest, these are a bit different in terms of the, the speed of change, the types of, of change, the availability of data. So things, of course, will be a bit different uh, in your monitoring. Uh, but fundamentally, the IPCC good, good, good practice guidelines is, is, is the same for all of, for all, for all of them. Um, there's a question on reforestation being a slow process. I think, uh, and, and you know, it takes time to build up, build up, up, up carbon. That's a good point. Uh, when you particularly talk about the remote sensing dimensions of that, um, I think we can do reasonably well in detecting uh, events that reduce forest cover uh, and reduce forest carbon stock, so deforestation, so de degradation events. If you're detecting reforestation, it's much more of a subtle process. It takes a couple of, of, of years. And uh, there is less remote sensing experience to do that, but it can also be done. Uh, so you can actually use remote sensing, in particular now, where you have relatively dense time series from the various remote sensing satellite data sources, you can actually track also reforestation. Uh, but that will give you, the remote sensing will give you the area of reforestation and maybe something about the, the speed and the, and the, and the, and the yeah, the quality of the recovery, so to, so to say. If you actually want to link that to carbon stocks, so how much carbon the reforestate, reforested or reforesting forest has actually been taken up, you have to include some measurements uh, from, the, from the bottom uh, bottom up. So if you combine the remote sensing areas of deforestation and reforestation, you have to include some measurements on how a forest re reforest. I mean, and in forest plantations, for example, Lots of measurements tend to be done because they, these measurements are done for management pur pur purposes, for you know harvesting cycles uh, uh, and so on. And that kind of data can be very useful in that process. And if you can do a smart combination with, with remote sensing, I think you have a good way uh, of of actually doing 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 that. Um, then there's a question on how much carbon in the crop fields uh, can store compared to reforestation. Um, uh, so, in terms of crop field, and again, think about the pools, uh, you have in a crop field, you can also have carbon in the soil. Um, there is a, a tendency if you uh, convert a forest to agriculture, and uh, if the agriculture involves tillage, that also your soil carbon stocks is, re is reduced because you start to basically expose more of the organic soil and mix up uh, the organic carbon in the soil. and 
you basically will release that that reduces generally reduces the carbon stocks in the soil. So there is a loss of carbon if you convert from a forest to an agricultural field. If you have an agricultural field which is, doesn't include woody crops, so wood crops, uh, so you know uh, shrubs or uh, uh, other kind of tree, tree crops, for example, the carbon stocks are actually not that high. Uh, and keep in mind those tend to be harvested every every year. So to get an average carbon stocks of an agricultural field, you usually take half of the of the, of the harvest as an as an average. The same you would do for plantation. So a long term average for a plantation would be uh, the half of the maximum carbon carbon carbon, carbon stocks because it, it actually if you have rotational cycles uh, you, you at some point in time there's no trees there or no crop there and then you have a maximum one so you take the average of that but in general agriculture fields have relatively low carbon stock four to seven to eight tons of carbon for example whereas uh, a good mature tropical rainforest ha easily has two to three hundred tons uh, so it's 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 a large difference. Um, let me read another question. So there was a, again a question on soils. Yes, I mean so the IMBC good practice guidelines do also provide you all the information, all the guidance you need to have to to estimate the emissions from the soil carbon pool. And I just gave an example of the agriculture one. The soil pool is particularly important if you have a lot of organic soils that are being subject to human act, active, active, active activities. If you do want to estimate soil carbon pool emissions, you do require also some measurements, and those have to be done on the on the ground. And oftentimes, what you have for the soil carbon pool, because the changes are very slow, often very subtle, that you combine measurements with some kind of a model. Uh, and have some kind of response functions because even if, for example, if you convert a forest to an agricultural field, um, uh, the release and, and and you and you till it, uh, the release takes a couple of, of of years. So in that sense, the soil is is a relatively small pool. Um, there is a question. Um, uh, so uh, the ultimate goal of the IPCC if countries have very different practices. Yes, I mean. It is one of the principles of the IPCC uh, to, be com to be comparable. Uh, and comparable means that all countries who use these guidelines, you can actually compare the estimations uh, from the national level to some extent. But in reality, that is not that easy because countries have different pre preferences, the uncertainties vary, vary by countries and stuff like that. So the idea that you basically sum up all the national greenhouse gas inventories to get the global effect I think that's a good idea, uh, but in practice that can probably be quite uh, complicated given the various levels. And that is actually okay, because the main purpose for the National Green Gas, gas Inventories is for the countries to report their performance now, after, particularly after Paris. So this regular updating, this regular stock taking after the Paris Agreement, that is the main purpose of, of that. It is not necessarily the purpose to sum up among all the all the countries. In, in terms of the global impact, I think that is where the data feeding into the IPCC, the regular IPCC reports, the scientific syn syn synthesis and so on, that's where some of that will actually be picked, picked up. Um, and then I'll take a last question, um, which was on, uh, again, on, agri on agriculture. So, um, uh, it's probably, in that, and I make this point because it will not come back uh, I think in this webinar series, but uh, if you think about the land use sector, there are important emissions from uh, deforestation and uh, forest degradation, but also the agricultural it's sector itself is a very important, has a lot of emissions. And in particular, if you think about uh, yeah, livestock, emissions from livestock, emissions from uh, rice, paddy, paddy rice, emissions from uh, agricultural soils, and that is also part of the strategy. And if you think about establishing monitoring systems, I mean, if you're monitoring forests, it's quite different than when you monitor agriculture. But of course, there are synergies that can be built. And so it would be advisable to try to uh, uh, evolve these monitoring systems together as much as, as, much as possible. I think with that, uh, we reached uh, 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 about the end of this webinar. Um, I uh, like to say thank you from my side. Uh, I, I hope you find it useful.
um, there's a lot of material that I was able to provide you today in this lecture, but also of other things you can follow up on. And perhaps I pass back to um, to the organizers to um, uh, perhaps have some final say on what's next. Great, thank you. This is um, Cindy Schmidt again, and I want to thank you, Martin, very much for this um, great overview. And um, to everyone uh, who's still out there, this is really a, a wonderful framework for what we're going to be presenting in the next four weeks. So with that, I wanted to leave you with some contact information. There's uh, my email address, Amber. Uh, Jenny Hewson from Silva Carbon is also helping us organize this webinar series. Um, if you have general RSET inquiries, you can contact Anna Prados. And again, uh, we have listed our RSET website where you can get all the recordings and the presentations. I know there were some issues with connectivity today, um, so please take a look at the recording. It'll be ready in about 24 hours. So with that, I want to thank everyone for attending this week. Um, next week, we'll talk more specifically about remote sensing sensors and products available for monitoring forests.